Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, Geiger number three from Image Comics. Now, this one is written by Jeff Johns with artwork by Gary Frank and coloring by Brad Anderson. This is the exact same creative team of Doomsday Clock. What's a Doomsday Clock? Well, you know, that's a bit, but we know what it is. Anyway, because of books like Doomsday Clock and DC Rebirth, I really feel like Jeff Johns in particular has learned a lot about the importance of metaphor and, and, and symbolism in comic books and how to utilize that into what he already knows, which is how to tell a great ongoing superhero story that feels, at least feels, one and done. And that's what Geiger does in issue number three. This was an all right week, but this was the one at the top of the pack for me. The artwork by Gary Frank was absolutely fantastic. The coloring was right there, but it's the story. It's those characters. It's the structure that Jeff Johns is using. Like I said, he's leaning more into metaphor and symbolism, but not quite as much as, say, he would have done in Doomsday Clock, trying to mimic an Alan Moore type vibe. This feels distinctly Jeff Johns, because at the same time, it's giving us a really great superhero story, great character work, and very impressive world building, and he's doing it all in the semblance of a one-and-done ongoing superhero melodrama, and that's what I like. This is a story about a dude who's like a radiated... Um, there's this like post-apocalypse nuclear wasteland in, in Vegas that's ruled by this little kid. And this is telling you a little bit more of the backstory of the glowing man who we do finally realize is called 100% Geiger in this issue. You get a lot of, of, of background detail, but you also get a really great structure. The way that this has been paced so far. Issue number one, introducing the concept in the world, introducing two or issue number two, introducing new elements to the story. And now in three, going back to what we were expecting for a part two, but integrating what we had in the not what we were expecting part two. This was a fantastic book. I loved it. I've loved it for three issues so far. And in this week, it stood out above the rest. The pick of the week is Geiger number three from Image Comics. We have some other Image Comics. Let's talk about the six sidekicks of Trigger Keaton, number one. Now, this is by Kyle Starks and uh, Chris Schweizer, or Chris Schweizer. Um, this is the exact same creative team that just blew me away on their Mars Attacks book together. Now, the artwork is, 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 it's a cartooning type artwork. Like, I mean, comic book artists are cartoonists, but this one, you really get that feel. Okay, so I really like Chris's work. That art style may not appeal to many people, but the story and the way that the artwork works with it is in, it just exceptionally crazy. So this is a story of, of Trigger Keaton. Imagine Trigger Keaton is kind of like a Chuck Norris, right? And what if all the rumors were that Chuck Norris was this a complete douchebag, right? That's, that's the idea. Okay, Trigger Nelson or Trigger Keaton is this big time action hero. Um, but he's just, he's a heavy drinker. He, he doesn't care about anybody else. He's super selfish. And the six sidekicks represent, or reference, I should say, <clears throat> the six sidekicks that he had on former television shows and or movies, right? So <laughs> Trigger Keaton is murdered, okay? And now it's up to the six sidekicks of this dude who, t for the most part, they don't like. It's up to them to solve the murder. It's a really interesting concept. It's done very tongue-in-cheek. It's incredibly funny and zany. It's got a great whimsical sense about it with the artwork and the uh, script combined. So Six Sidekicks of Trigger Keaton, I thought was pretty solid. Definitely one of the best books this week. The Good Asian, number two, is here. This is a story set in like the 30s, I believe, and it's during that whole era where there was this policy, what do they call it? It's, it what did they call it? It was the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, right? And so like Chinese people were not allowed into America, so they were put in these camps and all this kind of stuff, right? So this is a film noir, hard-boiled detective story from one of America's first um, Chinese 
American detectives, and it involves this idea. So it unlocks this aspect of history that not a lot of people remember or know about because it's not really talked about that much. So that's really interesting, but it's also giving us a really great detective story. The artwork is pretty solid throughout. Um, this issue didn't wow me as much as the first one, but at the end, it really did hook my interest into issue number three, The Good Asian. Number two out this week, film noir, and it's actually referencing an important part of American history that is quite overlooked at times. Carmen is here with issue number four, the penultimate issue. Um, this one was okay. Carmen has been really wowing me over the last three issues. Gilliam March doing a great job writing and illustrating this book. I feel like it's the tightest we've ever seen his work, but I feel like it gets a bit rushed in issue number four. It doesn't quite get so elaborate with its compositions. The story is there though, and it gets meaty. And the, you understand that March is probably, maybe the translation's in effect, because this is a French comic, I believe, that is translated now for an English speaking audience, but, or an English reading audience, I should say. Um, but it feels a bit too melodramatic, like overly so, and it doesn't quite have nuance to it, whether artistically or through the script, through the writing, right? So I feel like this one was probably the worst out of the batch, but saying it's the worst out of Carmen is not saying much because I've loved this series. I love its explorations on death and, and grief, but more so on the grief of, of you having taken your life and what happens if you realize and get to revisit. What happens if after you, like this is about a woman who kills herself and she gets to reflect on her life and her decision um, before she has to go into the light, right? And in this one, it starts building to a, a crux, right? It, it builds to a, a very crucial point. However, it just feels a bit too overwrought as far as the story goes and less put on the artwork. The artwork has been basically, I think, carrying the burden of the story in the first three issues. And issue number four, <clears throat> it's just okay. It's all right. But that that being said, it's pretty solid, right? Speaking of Gilliam March, he did The Joker. Uh, the Joker number four, written by James Tynan, with artwork by Gilliam March. Uh, I, I love this issue. I'm loving this book. I hate to recommend a book that is for no good reason, a $5.99 comic book. It's got the backup with Punchline. It's okay, I'll be honest with you this time. Like halfway through that thing, I just stopped reading it. But the main story by Tynan and March is fantastic. It's a Gordon-centric story that is haunted by the presence of Joker. And Joker makes his presence known in issue number four. This was a great wrap up of the first issue and a great segue and setup for what's to come. I am supremely excited about this book. It is one of DC's best. Um, Gillian March's artwork wasn't quite up to par with one, two, and three, but it does still deliver that, that, that film noir punch and tie-ins even though it is a bit verbose, is able to tell a really solid Gordon story involving the, the, the idea of the Joker, but still not make it completely about the Joker, but still have a Joker book about the Joker. And by the way, there's plenty of Joker in this book. The Joker number four. Fantastic. Loved it. Detective Comics 1037. It's a really good issue. First of all, cover of the week right there for me. I just love the composition on that cover by Dan Mora. However, Dan Mora did not do the interior, and Dan has been one of the highlights to me of this run so far. So I was really nervous about this one because we have uh, Victor Bogdanovic doing his very first fill-in issue. And for the most part, except for like the last page of his chapter, I thought it was pretty solid all the way through. I really liked this issue. I thought it was one of uh, Tamaki's best scripted issues so far. All the plot threads are coming together. Um, this whole Worth character. and But like I said, it gets at the end Victor's work gets a bit wonky, I feel, on that last bit. There are two backups in here. One's pretty solid because it's a uh, uh, John Ridley and Dustin Wynn doing like a old school Batman and Robin story. But the other one was uh, uh, Carl Mostert and, um, and Mariko Tamaki. And it was just, it was just okay. It slightly ties into this whole idea. But all, overall, Detective Comics has been good, mostly because of the Dan Mora artwork. But don't be afraid that he's not on this issue because Victor does a pretty solid job carrying it through. Batman the Detective number three is here from Tom Taylor. Andy Kubert, I loved this issue. This one has some slight resemblances to Detective Comics which it's not confusing enough that we have Batman 
The Detective and Batman in Detective Comics out in the same week. Like, imagine if you said, like, one of your homies or, or your lover or something like this, say they didn't know anything about comics. Say you sent them into the shop to pick up, oh, I need that Batman Detective book. Yo, which one? Also, they kind of have almost elements of the same story. I think it's done better in Batman the Detective. Andy Kubert, Tom Taylor doing a great job of making Batman feel international like he did back in the 70s. Um, this is a Elseworlds type story where Batman's a little bit older and he's decided to, like, you know, I'm not going to clean up Gotham, so let's just go wherever I'm needed. In this instance, he goes to England. This brings up some of his past with Henry Ducard and how he was trained to be a detective so it's focusing on the detective nature of Batman and at the same time giving us a little bit of a a different take and perspective on the Ducard and and Bruce Wayne training bit right there um I like this issue I liked it a lot like I said it shares a lot of story ideas with detective comics but Batman the detective I thought was the stronger book this week number three is out this week check it out hey another Batman book can you believe it um, Urban Legends number four. This book is worth it mostly for the Chip Zdarsky, Eddie Barrows, and at this point, I think Marcus Toe jumps in. Um, Red Hood Batman story. That one is really good. Um, they've been they've been doing some really great work right now at DC Comics with Jason Todd, the Red Hood, who is a character that I've never really liked it that much, but I'm actually liking him more and more the more I get into these kind of issues. The Chip Zdarsky Batman one. With Red Hood is fantastic. The artwork is great. Um, it goes back to the whole death in the family type thing. Um, but it also is, it's, it's using the past to spin into the revel relevancy of what's going on in the present day story. Um, you got a Batwing story that's okay. You got a Tim Drake story. It's okay, but I'm just excited to have a Tim Drake story. It's going to be a three part, so it's going to continue for the next couple issues. And then the Grifter story at the end by Matthew Rosenberg. I've been loving that one because I'm an old school Wildcats fan. And let me just give you one word. Zealot. Yes, and I know. How many times has DC teased the idea that, yo, we're going to integrate the Wildcats and this is for real this time? Whatever, I'll believe that when I see it, but I always get excited to see some of my favorite characters from the Wildcats. Future State Gotham is delivering some more information about the best part of DC Future State, which was the Magistrate Gotham-centric books. This is a really fun book. Josh Williamson, um, he's got a co-writer on this one, I do believe. Let me find the name. It is Dennis Culver and Giannis Milo Giannis does the artwork. It's very Akira-inspired, very manga-esque, um, but I like it. I'm loving this book. I thought the Magistrate idea was the best part of DC Future State and the Red Hood's involvement as a peacekeeper. Or peace, is it peacekeeper or peacemaker? It's peacekeeper, right? It's peacemaker? As a peace whatever. Um, the Red Hood's involvement's interesting because Bruce asked him to infiltrate the Magistrate, but the Bat family doesn't know that, and they think Bruce is dead, but Jason knows Bruce is alive. So it puts Jason in this idea of, you know what, I'm just going to do the right thing and do what I feel is the right thing. That's the thing I love and what I'm, I'm learning about Jason and what I'm respecting more about this character through the pages of Future State Gotham and the Batman Urban Legends story by Chip Zdarsky is that Jason does what he thinks is right no matter what. Even if that means going against Bruce and the family or going with Bruce and against the family. Like I said, it's got an Akira manga-esque kind of influence to it with the artwork, but I love it. The backup story is pretty decent. It's all right. It's John Ridley doing more of the Batman, uh, next Batman, the, the Jace Batman and his sidekick. So if you want more of that, there you go. Justice League Last Ride. Yo, number two, I am so thankful that this is not the last ride of Justice League Last Ride because it's only issue number two. Maybe I'll probably do that bit a little bit better on my top 10 video with Jim Mint Collectibles. Always check out Jim Mint Collectibles. His weekly reviews are always on fire and me and him collaborate together. And every Friday morning, we talk about our top 10 comic books of the week. You don't want to miss that show. Justice League, Last Ride, number two. This book was awesome. It's written by Chip Zdarsky. It's got an amazing cover by Derek Robertson. And it's got artwork by Mendoncia. Um, and I cannot find the first name right now, but I'll just say this. If you were dissuaded by the first issue, if it didn't sell you, definitely check out issue number two. This is a story set in an else world. In fact, the rumors are saying that this is the else world. If you read De uh, Death Metal, 
you will know that there's Earth Prime, which is the DC universe we know in most DC comics, and then there's the mysterious Elseworld now in the DC Omniverse. And it's going to be very important going forward. I really think that this is... I think that this is this world. And it's a world that's been invaded by Apocalypse and, and lost. And we saw in the first issue a Justice League that's been shattered and torn apart, right? And that was a really interesting character exploration. It's been done before, but it was done really well by Chip Zdarsky, who, like I've said many times before, understands the legacy and history of these characters, but can make it feel fresh yet classic at the same time. Chip Zdarsky is doing what a lot of writers are enabled to do right now, is, is bridge the past and the future. Like, he's able to write these superhero stories like they were in the past, as silly, as goofy, as complex and, and absurd, but at the same time feel cinematic. At the same time, feel episodic and feel a little bit decompressed and, and it's the best of both worlds with him and you get that in here. So we know that this is a Just League Shattered. The reason why they are shattered is because they lost to Darkseid, right? Which, by the way, they did that in Grant Morrison's Final Crisis. If you want to know what it's like to see Darkseid win in the DC Universe, read Final Crisis. It, it gets crazy. Um, but this shows how this epic just dire circumstances that just are amazing as comic book superhero DC fans. We will love this book. You will love this book if you are that hardcore of a DC fan. You see moments that will break your heart. You see moments that will be shocking. They explain and show a little bit about how the Justice League falls to Apocalypse. And now, of course, they got this new mission where they're trying to hide Lobo on Apocalypse, and it's all related, and it's just incredibly well done. Justice League Last Ride, don't sleep on that book. I think that book is going to be way more important than people are anticipating right now. Wonder Woman 773. Well, I'm really loving Wonder Woman right now. Like, really, really loving Wonder Woman right now. Written by De uh, Becky Cloonan, Michael Conrad, with artwork by Travis Moore, and Tamara Bond Villain on the coloring. The artwork in this book is so freaking solid. It's great. So at the end of Death Metal, Wonder Woman kind of sacrifices herself. In Infinite Frontier number zero, we see that she's offered a place with the Quintessence, but she refuses it, and she wants to go back to Earth and help her friends, um, the Justice League, uh, battle against what's going to come because she got to see all these possible futures through hyper time, which led to the idea of her vision of DC Future State. A lot of visions, right? Um, so on her way back, she gets lost in the sphere of the gods. And I love that they're still using the Grant Morrison ideas and the maps and all that stuff. And I definitely got to get mine framed one day and put it up. Um, so I can just, you know, I should make notes on it and everything like you do, like a Bible and Bible study. Anyway, Wonder Woman 773 was great because it's the end of this arc. She's lost in the sphere of gods. She lands in Valhalla. She is fighting the never-ending battle, but people are not coming back. She's solving this mystery. The Valkyries aren't coming to reap these souls and bring them back. What's going on? Um, and this is the, the climactic finish of that story, and it's done very well. This story reads long but at the same time, incredibly engaging and enthralling all the way through. The artwork is so solid. The line work is so clean, yet detailed. It's got a density about it. This book is absolutely amazing. It's solid, it's fun, and it has been since this team has taken over. Wonder Woman 773, super solid. Challenge of the Super Sons, number three. Uh, it's great to see Peter Tomasi flex his muscles and do some proper stretches over at the, the, the Super Sons era, where we had Damian Wayne, and we had Jonathan Kent pre-being aged up by Brian Michael Bendis. And yes, Bendis, as much as we love and respect your work that came before, and y'all, Jinx and Goldfish forever and powers, come on. But, yo, and Ultimate Spider-Man. But, yo, we can never forgive Bendis for aging up Jonathan Kent because we lost years, decades probably, of Super Sons books. But I'm glad that DC recognizes that. They bring in Peter Tomasi to fill in some gaps. Um, not really filling in gaps, but just telling a story in between those gaps. And I really, really like this. It's a timey-wimey type story where, where Damien and Jonathan are flung through time against Felix Faust and Vandal Savage, and they're trying to save the Justice League from a terrible death, and they don't understand what's going on, but it's fun, and it's light, and it's, it's nice. 
But it would be really nice if uh, we never had the aged up Jonathan Kent. We could have Super Sons stories that matter. That'd be really cool. DC Pride is here, and happy Pride Month, everybody. Station, um, DC Pride is one of the best Pride-centric one-shot anthologies I have ever read. I actually really, really like this one. You've got amazing talent on this book. So it's a celebration of LGBTQIA plus characters by creators that are LGBTQIA plus. And I really liked it for the most part. It's got some bangers in it. Um, James Tynan does a really great Batwoman story that I think fans of Batwoman really, really like. Um, Steve Orlando does a really cool story involving Constantine, but mostly Midnighter. Um, that's great. Try the Girls, Evita Ayala story. Got worked by Mariko Tamaki, Sam Johns, Klaus Jansen. Did a really great story in here. Probably my favorite in the whole batch. And it's Alan Scott, newly out Alan Scott, talking to his son Obsidian for the first time. And if you have a reference to the history of those characters throughout DC, especially, I would say, post-crisis, you can really get this. And, and it was a really solid, solid story. Uh, Danny Lord is a great one. Clothes, makeup, gift. That's uh, Jess Chambers, the future version of The Flash, a uh, non-binary character. Uh, Cena Grace does a Be Gay, Do Crime. Is that the one that's tied into The Flash? There's one that's tied into The Flash. Yeah. That one I didn't quite get. I'm, I'm, I'm really quite the Cena Grace fan. Uh, getting it together, by the way. Check that out. Dreamer. This one introduces Dreamer into the super into the DC universe proper. Dreamers from Supergirl show, which I stopped watching, um, and then there's a, the end story, Date Night, and there's Love Life too. Those ones I, I don't even really remember those, but there's some pretty solid ones. It's a really great celebration. Or, oh, the last one's the JLQ story. That was really cool. I actually like this is Justice League queer right there. I it, it's an interesting concept. I thought it was a really cool moment. This, seriously, I get so tired of these DC anthologies that are wrapping themselves around events or seasons or whatever, but I really felt like this was a really great celebration just because, for the, for the most part, the stories are pretty good. So DC Pride number one is a pretty good buy. Batman Scooby-Doo Mysteries number three. Let me tell you about this book. Um, this book's got Two-Face in it. It's got Ace the Bat Hound in it. Ace and Scooby having some fun together. That's all I need. In a spotlight, a spotlight. And let's be honest, the absolute hottest Scooby member is Daphne, right? Is her name Daphne? Her name is Daphne, right? Am I wrong on that? Thelma and Daphne, right? Anyway, that one right there. It is Daphne, right? Did he just say making fuck? No, he said Daphne. Anyway, it is Daphne, right? Anyway, this is fun. It's all ages. It's silly. It's not taking itself seriously. You shouldn't take this book seriously. Um, it's $2.99, just like Spawn. Spawn's a little bit more mature, but this one, I think, is just as just as well-written, to be honest with you. So support your $2.99 comics when they come around, and then read it. And if you don't like it, just give it to your kid. Give it to your, your niece or nephew. Give it to somebody who's going to read it. But this is just a nice, fun book. Like I said, Ace the Bat Hound, Scooby-Doo, together, and a story focusing on Daphne. It is Daphne. Is it Daphne? Rorschach is here with issue number nine. Um, this was a really great issue. I don't think it was as structurally sound and, and as far as the composition. I thought they, they really blew me away with issue number eight. Um, number nine was really solid, though. And they, they're, they're playing with that structure again. I love what Jorge Fornes is doing because he's able to take the grid structure that's established so supremely established by Dave Gibbons in the pages of Watchmen. And he's playing with it. And he's doing his own thing with it. And he's giving it more room to breathe. And he's giving each issue a different character as far as the composition goes that is not just 100% The Watchmen. I love that artistically about this book. And that's why I will always sing the praises of this book. I also really highlight what Tom King is doing with the story. He is doing an amazing job of taking a book that is a sequel, if you will, to The Watchmen, which doesn't typically work out. Okay, let's just be honest. But he's doing it in a way that's it's exploring more of the thematics. It's exploring more of the impact on the creators. It's exploring more of the impact of the effect of the Watchmen on the comic book industry and not just to superheroes, but to the creators. I think that is supremely well done. And to me, makes this, as far as nine issues go, and we'll see, three issues are left, how it wraps up, this is on its way to be the best follow-up 
to The Watchmen because it explores The Watchmen's effect on the industry as far as creators go in particular and just as far as that story goes and the philosophy of The Watchmen and in particular the philosophy of the character Rorschach and how that involves the philosophy of comic book creators that may have created characters that directly inspire the creation of Rorschach. This book is so meta, it goes beyond meta out into non-meta again. It's great. Rorschach number nine. Check it out. It's great. It's fantastic. Let's jump over to Marvel. And from Marvel, we have Web of Spider-Man number one. It's a new five-issue miniseries. And <sighs> let me just say this. We already know that I'm not the biggest fan of Amazing Spider-Man right now. But I always get at least a little excited when there's a new Spider-Man book on the horizon. Even if it's just a miniseries, maybe something different, something new. I can get my Spider-Man fix and really enjoy the character. Uh, what the hell is this? I don't understand. This book, first of all, feels out of continuity. If it's out of continuity, make it, like, established. So I don't know what where this is supposed to fit. It's about Spider-Man. He's part of Web, which is a... It means something. W-E-B. I don't even remember. But it's, like, this group that Tony Stark has put together. And it's got the greatest young scientific minds. I mean, they've done this before. They did this on Unstoppable Wasp. That We did this with Future Foundation. So we're doing it again with Spider-Man, but it doesn't feel like it's part of continuity. I really don't feel like it is. It feels more like it's connected to the Sony MCU Spider-Man. Yo, let me just tell you this. This this book was whack. It is just too generic, too average and mediocre. It was an okay, I guess, Spider-Man story for someone reading their first Spidey book. This is my first Spider-Man book. That's what this is. Web of Spider-Man number one. Okay. Well, maybe Amazing Spider-Man number 68 can make me feel better about the status of one of the greatest web crawlers ever, if not the greatest, over at Marvel. No! Amazing Spider-Man 68, don't worry all, all is right with the world yet again. I hated this issue. First of all, Nick Spencer can't even be bothered to be writing all these issues. He understands what he's doing, I feel, and he brings in Ed Brisson. Oh man, poor Ed Brisson has to show up and probably script this entire issue off of a plot from Nick Spencer. It's ridiculously dumb. It's all over the place. It's, it's tying back to things that should make me excited. That's what I, uh, Nick Spencer is doing references to 80s Spider-Man stories, Hobgoblin stuff. Right? With Ned Leeds. Superman vs. Wolverine. Come on, y'all. I love that. That web of Spider-Man. What was it? Number 28, 29, something like that. It was like a direct follow. But come on. I love those books. And he's tying it into the... When, when the Parkers came back. When Peter's parents came back and the Vulture was young. And those days. Like, come on, man. You're, you're tying into my nostalgia. But you're just making it boring and drab. And I don't care. And the thing that bothers me even the most in this entire issue is that there is... Yeah, there's an ad right there. For the Sinister War, okay, oh, ooh, oh, or not even the Sinister War, but the, the, the prelude, right? And, and it says in issue 71, Kindred makes his move. How many times has Kindred made his move? I am so freaking tired of this book. We need hypeness. We need excitement. We need something that gets us riled up the way that Venom or Thor or Hulk gets us riled up right now. Marvel, what are you doing? Your Spider-Man book is pissing me off. Spider-Man Spider Shadow, however, is a really great Spider-Man book. It's written by Chip Zdarsky with artwork by Pascal Ferry. This blew me away. It's a what-if story. By the way, if you want to tell a what-if story... Let it be known it's a what-if story. Then we can cut off those continuity bearers um, and just enjoy a great book. Web of Spider-Man, not so much. Spider's Shadow, if you are going to buy one Spider-Man book this week, hell, this month, make it Spider's Shadow. This book is phenomenal. It's a what-if story. What if Spider-Man was possessed by the Venom symbiote? What if Spider-Man became Venom? Yes, we've had that story before. But what I love about this new idea is basically to give what ifs as a, as a, an imprint and give them mini series and let them have the room to make those big moments have impact. All of those what ifs, they are amazing and they all end so darkly. And being a kid reading those books, like they all end so tragically for the most part that it's just like, oh, oh my God. But if you give it time to actually let that resonate, to let it have impact and punch and hit you, which you do in a five issue story like this, it works. And then there's a twist here at the end that I'm like, yo, I think 
Chip Zdarsky just created Marvel's throughout the Marvel multiverse. I think they just created the absolute most terrifying villain I can think of. Seriously, read this book. It's amazing. X-Men number 21 is here. This is Hickman's last issue of X-Men proper because Jerry Duggan's about to take over. And this is part of the Hellfire, uh, the Hellfire Gala event. But knowing it was Hickman's last issue, I was supremely excited to check it out. And it's got moments that I think soar. It opens up with a conversation between Namor and Xavier and Magneto um, with artwork by Nick Dragata, who is the artist of East of West that didn't feel as clean as the art on East of West, but it still just gave it an impact of that was my favorite moment of this book. And then the rest just kind of meanders around. It's a lot of setup. The last issue was so freaking act just so amazing and now we know that this is hickman's last issue of x-men he's moving into inferno and i firmly believe that inferno is not the end of it there is more coming there's got to be because hickman is setting up some stuff in this issue so overall i liked it but i was a bit disappointed because it didn't quite like for hickman's last issue i wanted something like that really directly just made me go <clears throat> And this was mostly like an afterthought. It feels like the last issue was actually number 20, and this is an epilogue, right? This is an in-between issue to things, right? But X-Men number 21, still pretty solid. Heroes Reborn soars on through with issue number six. Really like this issue. It's spotlight on Power Princess. I've already given my thoughts on the idea of a, of a pseudo-event disguised as a pseudo-event because it's just a series of one-shots to get people to know who the Squadron Supreme are and to bring them more in line with their DC counterparts. But aside from that, I really like this issue. I thought it had some cool stuff. The artwork was probably, to me, the weakest of all of the Heroes Reborns so far. That was Erica de Urso. I, I'm not familiar with their work, but I thought it was okay. But you've had some, some really top-notch veterans of the industry um, doing some work on Heroes Reborn. But overall, I'm, I'm still liking it, actually. I like Heroes Reborn. I don't think it's the greatest thing ever. I think it's a terrible approach to the story. I think it's a terrible way to market it. Um, but that being said, we're near the end. So I'm a little bit more forgiving. But I'm not so forgiving of these one-shot tie-ins. Uh, Squadron Savage. This was interesting enough. It's kind of like... So you have this... the. If the Squadron Supreme of the Justice League, this is the Justice League Dark, but not meaning magic-based. Just like, this is the Wetworks team, and his Punisher, it's Elektra, there's the Hornet. I'm pretty sure that's Nadia, Nadia Pym, and you got uh, uh, Crossbones, and uh, uh, I keep trying to say Shroud, but it's not Shroud. I know that's Cloak. It's Cloak. Um, it's an interesting team. There's some interesting ideas here, but overall, it's really not worth it picking up. Then we got Night Gwen. Night Gwen is a story about Gwen Stacy becoming the Robin of the Squadron Supreme universe. Um, it was not very interesting to me. It kind of rambled on for a bit. I was disappointed a little bit because I really respect Vita Ayala, the writer. Um, but it was just kind of meandering around. But I just, I don't really like, I, I just didn't care that much. It just didn't work for me. It just kind of, yeah, just didn't work. Anyway, Strange Academy number 11 works. And let me just highlight the fact that we have 11 issues in a row of Humberto Ramos on the artwork. That is amazing. I was so cynical that he was going to be able to stick it out. And he has proven me wrong. And I'm so glad because this book has been great. It's like Harry Potter meets the X-Men or definitely Wolverine in the X-Men, the Jason Aaron, Nick Bradshaw early days. That was some really good stuff. Meets... The Marvel Universe and the magical side. It's really fun. This book has been great. Introducing new characters, making me care about them. I always compare Teen Titans Academy to this book because if you read Teen Titans Academy and you like that, like, and you haven't read Strange Academy, read this one. This one is doing the what the idea is, but doing it so freaking well. These characters come out of nowhere, tied into different portions of the DC Universe. The characters though, feel like they matter. They have a really great uh, sense of uh, dynamic between the team, between the students and, 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 the, and the teachers. I'm loving this book. The artwork is great. The story's great. And this one, the, the crystal dude from Weird World, he's murdered. He's moited, right? But don't worry, they can put him back together. But they got to solve the mystery. This is a great detective story done in a one-and-done superhero-type vein, but it sets up for what's to come. It's still an ongoing mystery. Strange Academy, number 11. That book took it to 11. 
Let's jump over to Boom Studios where we have Eve number two. Eve is the story of, let's say Neo woke up in the Matrix and he was the only human left alive and it was solely up to him to save the world. That's what Eve is about. So Eve lived in this holographic mental world and in actuality she wakes up one day and her teddy bear who's, who talks to her is a mechanical like like drone that's programmed by her father because Eve is the last hope in a world where say the the floods have risen and a virus has been unleashed and maybe there's some zombies around or some shit like that right um Eve is the last hope to get things right this is a really well done second issue second issues are very difficult to do first issues I wouldn't say they're the easiest thing to do, but once you get a good first issue, it's really difficult to follow that up. Eve number two did that. This was a super solid book, a really interesting story, great artwork, great composition, great pace throughout the entire thing. Eve number two was worth it. And on a slightly light week, I would recommend it. I would also recommend Wind. Wind number seven. This is James Tynan flexing those simple fantasy uh, muscles, but with a very... Um, endearing, enchanting, uh -huh, get it? Because it's fantasy with magic, uh, enchanting. Um, but also just a really to the heart uh, human story. I really, really like Wind. I'm not the biggest fantasy fan, but they have won me over on Wind since like the second or third issue. I feel like it's getting paced better now for issue to issue. Each issue is extra size. It's meant to be written for the graphic novel, but the artwork by Michael Dialinus, um, Dialinus absolutely freaking works and is able to stretch out that Tynan script so that it flows. This is the quickest paced Tynan book you will ever read. Even though it's extra size, it reads the same, if not quicker than some of his other work, especially say like a Department of Truth or something. But Wind number seven blew me away. Really liking that book. Then we got Proctor Valley Road number four, the penultimate issue by Grant Morrison and Alex Childs, um, Naomi Franquez, Tamara Bond Villain on the artwork. Um, loving this book. It's started out with a little bit of a 70s Stranger Things vibe, but it goes way more intense than that. What if the kids from Stranger Things were uh, basically accused of murdering Will? That's what is happening in here. And there's a lot of heat supernaturally and in the real world uh, uh, on this group of girls who they feel are responsible for the death of these two young men because they took them out to this supposedly haunted area and then ditched them out there and they've never shown back up. But the supposedly haunted area is in fact haunted. This is a really cool book, soon to be made into a movie or TV show or something like that. So get on the board, get on the board, get on the bus, get on board right now. Proctor Valley Road number four was dope. Mighty Morphin number eight, wrapping up this second story arc. Ryan Pear has been doing a great job introducing new concepts, new ideas to the world and the mythology and the lore of Power Rangers, including all the stuff about Zordon, his race, what they're doing, the Zeo Crystal, it all gets referenced here and tied into a really great story of distrust and 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 when you feel like you're just not good enough and maybe somebody else is, right? So you got this interesting dynamic going on right now between the Green Ranger and Tommy the White Ranger um, and the public persona of the Green Ranger, which is a really cool exploration even into like a meta type idea about the idea of how important this one character is in all of Power Rangers, the Green Ranger and the celebrity aspect of it. But I think there's some subtext going on there that's a little bit meta, but I also just think it's a really great, fun superhero book and the best interpretation of Power Rangers we ever have has been by Ryan Parrott. It continues in Mighty Morphin number eight. Then we have Bunny Mask number one, a new one from Aftershock, Paul Tobin, Andrea Muti, Taylor Esposito. Uh, this is Muti's one of two books out this week from Aftershock. So first of all, I got to highlight the artwork. The artwork is great. I love this cat. He does Maniac of New York, which concludes we're about to talk about that this week. Um, and he also has done uh, Fearscape and the sequel to Fearscape, Dark Interlude, which is still going on right now. So this one is a horror story about this dude who I think he's like a social services worker or something. And he goes to check out this dude who's a allegedly abusing his daughter and turns out he is because he's crazy he's hearing this voice from something called the snitch and he's like breaking his daughter's teeth or something he's got this cave there are bodies in there he goes in there it's all crazy he gets captured and then this random woman in a bunny mask saves him and kills the dude and allegedly he thinks kills he thinks the dude has killed the daughter 
And then years later, he finds the daughter, and the daughter is a successful artist, and she's making these paintings of this bunny mask woman. Ooh, so there's the, there's the hook. So it's pretty interesting. It didn't completely wow me, but it was engaging and it did keep me interested all the way through enough to come back for issue number two and see what what happens. It didn't completely blow me away or wow me, but it was solid enough. Maniac of New York, number five. This is the final of issue for now because they do announce at the end of this a next series. And that's cool and it's exciting to see that this is going to continue because as a final issue, it just didn't quite work for me. It was too exposition-y, it was too uh, cerebral, it didn't quite have enough punch. If you want to do a five issue story, which five issues, that's a nice tight story, you can really fit your structure in there. I need a punchy ending. This is not a punchy ending, this is all set up. And I know that, I guess at this point in scripting, they knew that there was going to be a sequel to this, and I'm excited that there is. But don't depend on a sequel. Give us a nice, tight, punchy ending. I feel like Maniac of New York lost that for me in issue number five. But I am still excited to see what happens, because the artwork is amazing. Baby Teeth number 18. Completely losing me. Uh, this book has been so erratic. It hasn't been out in a while. And then there was issue 17, like last month, and now we have an issue 18. Um, and I'm just a bit lost in the story. Maybe I just need to stop reading it and just read it when it's all done. I think there's only a handful of issues left, but it's Donnie Cates. It's, it's one of these books that he worked on before he got super, super into the know. Um, so maybe it's taken a back burner because of that, but it's all right. It's the story of like the Antichrist that's born and it, it's got a lot of family drama, but I'm completely lost in all of it right now. But that being said, I really thought that this was some of the strongest artwork that we've seen in Baby Teeth. Maybe because artists had forever to do it. Space Bastards is here with issue number six. We have Simon Bisley, Bisley? Is it Bisley or Bisley? I'm not quite sure on that, but Space Bastards returns with its second arc. And I was curious to see where it was going to go after the conclusion of issue number five. Um, and it didn't quite impress me as much as, say, one, two, three, four, or five did. You got Simon Bisley, Bisley, is it Bisley or Bisley? Um, doing the artwork, and the artwork is cool. Let me make sure I show you an appropriate page. But the story was a little bit muddy. I didn't quite get it. It goes into a completely different story, but set in the same universe. So it seems like this is aimed to be a series of stories that are basically overall an anthology in the same world. And that's interesting, and that's cool. And maybe in this one, they're just highlighting certain characters. But uh, this one's about this dude. He's a recovering alcoholic. Um, and it does have a nice tie-in and throwback to the original story towards the end. But I don't know. This one, it was wild. It was rambunctious. It was in your face. But it just didn't quite engage me as much as the last one. It wasn't the artwork and it wasn't the world. I guess it just was the story, the way it was structured. Space Bastards number six didn't really win me over. Then we have Cherry Blackbird from Black Caravan, which is a horror imprint for Scout. Um, I really didn't like this book. It was wild. It starts off so freaking weird. This demon basically comes out of this dude's ass. Okay. Like this demon just, just rises out of this dude's ass. It's an intense scene. I would show it to you, but obviously I, I can't because they show it all. You know what I'm saying? Um, so it's a weird idea and it's the whole idea of a musician selling their soul to a demon and they got to make payment, right? And so the demon shows up to this one, the, the, the chick on the cover here and he's like, yo, one more year and you're mine unless you go and hunt down these escaped sins and demons from hell for me. So it's that kind of a gist, but it just didn't work for me structurally. It was all over the place. It was trying to be subversive it was trying to be irreverent it was trying to be crude but it just went a little too over the top and just into silliness for me so cherry blackbird number one just did not work for me then we have the secret land number one from uh, dark horse comics christopher ingard and thomas era I probably butchered their names i apologize for that but this book was okay it was pretty decent the secret land is about these two lovers one is a military dude one is a spy chick so the military dude one Ends up going to the Japanese front and the spy chick winds up going to the German front, right? And the, 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 the military dude, the soldier dude, the army dude gets a telegram that his chick is dead. So then he like winds up being really just kind of reckless, but very heroic in his war. 
And then we find out that no, Chick's not actually dead. She's undercover even further. And after Hitler's committed suicide, after Germany has surrendered World War II, they are going to Antarctica to build the secret base to reveal these secret occult plans. All of that sounds really interesting. It's kind of like Pearl Harbor with a little bit of Hellboy thrown in there. His name is Hellboy. But it just didn't work. It just felt flat to me a little bit. It didn't feel enticing, whether through the artwork or through the story. It was interesting enough as far as the concept goes, but it just didn't work. And I felt like each issue I was turning the page being like, is this not the last page? So overall, I wouldn't recommend this one. I thought it was just eh, a little bit uh, below mediocre. Anyway, that's what I read this week. That's what I thought about it. What are you reading? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below. Hell, what was your pick of the week? What was your top five? What was your top 10? And be sure to check out my top 10 when I reveal it on Jim Mint Collectibles Friday morning along with my good homie Jim Mint. So thank you so much for checking out the video. Please be sure to like, share, subscribe, and check us out over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts, blogs, merch, and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading. Station.